purpose of this video is just to give you some pointers on the last couple problems on worksheet number four. We did the other two, <coughs> excuse me, the other two problems in class, but um, I want to look at problems number three and uh, four here. So this is when we talked about how we determine whether or not a species is sexually reproducing or asexually reproducing. And again, for most species, it's a fairly easy task. Uh, males and females are sexually dimorphic. We can tell them apart, if not easily externally, then with internal morphology. But there are some circumstances where it might be tricky. We might not have a large enough sample size. We might have all females, and so we don't know if it's an asexual population that's reproducing parthenogenetically with just all females or whether we just have missed the males. And so to do this, the easiest way to do it would be to make phylogenies of the samples that we have. So we have four or five individuals from the same species to make a phylogeny using different genetic markers and then compare those phylogenies. And if those phylogenies are identical, then it's almost certainly an asexually reproducing population because all of the uh, genes have been inherited down the same lineages. And so that would be reconstructed as identical phylogenies. However, if we get significant differences between one gene and the other, that is a sign that there has been recombination uh, between those genes, and so that's a sign for sexual reproduction. Okay, so just you need to say we just make a phylogeny using different genetic markers. If there is the exact pattern of relationships, it's asexual. If not, then there's sexual reproduction going on. Okay, and then this last one is talking about antagonistic coevolution, and we're going to look at mating pressures between the sexes. We talked in this last uh, lecture, four point um, three, about uh, some of the conflict that can arise between males and females in this what we call um, a sexual arms race or antagonistic um, interactions between males and females. An extreme example of this, which we didn't talk about in the uh, lecture, is called sperm toxicity. And in sperm toxicity, the male actually produces substances in the um, ejaculate that are toxic and begin to kill the female. And at first glance, this would seem to be a really bad idea, right? Really not an advantage at all. However, under certain circumstances, when the environment is right, uh, if a male w poisons her his mate, then she will slowly die, but after she has laid his eggs. So she lays all of his eggs, but then she doesn't have the opportunity to mate again or is too weak to mate again, and so his offspring are not competing with the offspring from other males. And so when that's has evolved, everyone that has, that mutation has arisen in populations where the environment is conducive to it, it will be selected for and eventually get this kind of very unusual behavior. However, as we mentioned, that's good for the males, but it's really bad for the females, right? You don't want to be poisoned, you want to have as many mating opportunities and live as long as you can to reproduce more and more. That maximizes your fitness. So the females will have selection where they will resist that. If there's any variation genetically in the, amongst the females uh, regards to their ability to re resist that sperm toxicity, then it will be selected for and females will become more resistant. And then if there's more variability available in the males, they may become slightly more toxic. And so we get this kind of back and forth, back and forth, not unlike the um, buildup of nuclear weapons that happened during the Cold War or other arms races where one will build something and the other one will respond and you get this kind of back and forth. So that's why they use the term sexual arms race. And so given enough time, you would expect to see some response among the females natural selection towards an increased resistance to that toxicity. And then of course up here, what type of mating system and life history are most likely to see sperm toxicity? So I've only listed two of the five that we talked about here, but really if there's any sort of mate bond at all, whether it's monogamous, polygamous, um, polyandrous, poly, poly, polygynous, um, any of those, you're not going to see sperm toxicity because when there is a strong pair bond, your fitness is tied up and associated with your mates to a very, very high degree. So it's only going to be in these promiscuous systems where your fitness is still tied up with a mate, but all you really care about is are they able to lay your eggs. And so that would be the, the environment, the conditions where sperm toxicity could evolve. So it's really only in promiscuous mating systems.